Good to see everybody. I feel like that's a little loud. Um, that seem loud? I'm getting a lot of echo up here. Time out for just a minute. I'm sorry. Is it loud? Okay. So I'm going to keep it on. I'm sorry, but I got to get it right. Um, Oh, but if I whisper, I won't know if it's too loud. I have pretty good hearing. All right, turn the game down. Just turn down right here. That's all I can do. Let's see. What number is that? Put the game out there. Is that better? How's that? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. That seems better. That seem better. No. Felt a little echoey. Is that as bad? Nobody's t nobody's talking to me, so maybe they can't hear me at all. Is that as bad as it was? No. Is that better? Thank you. Sorry about that, but uh, it is good to see you as we get started. You never know what you're going to come into, uh, but I'm glad you're here. In just a minute, we'll pick back up in our study uh, in 2 Samuel. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and be turning there in your Bibles, um, we'll, we'll jump into that in just a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 4. Uh, a reminder, uh, this Saturday is the men's meeting at 9 o'clock here at the building. So uh, please, guys, uh, plan to be here for that. Um, I guess that'll be available for call in too. So uh, if you can't be here in person, I will make that available. Also, just as a reminder, uh, if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and download the directory app. Don't forget, if you need to update information, there's these sheets back in the foyer. There's also, and I should have grabbed one, but there's an explanation sheet back there as well. It tells you how to log on, how to get to your information. Several people I know have already started uploading pictures and correcting information. I really appreciate that. If you have any questions, see Sandy, or you can see me. Uh, but we will try to help you out with that. Um, but it's not, uh, not as difficult as it might seem. But we, we're here to help in any way we can. Uh, on our prayer list, just please continue to remember those. We've been praying for, I know we mentioned on Sunday, um, is it Baby Ray? in California, uh, which is Van's, uh, be Van's nephew, uh, is to be born uh, in April, but he needs surgery now. So on the 26th, I believe, um, they're going to do surgery on him in womb. So please pray for, for mom and dad and, and him too. Um, any other prayer requests, things we need to remember? Van's sick. So pray for Van. Our son Daniel is down too. He got a negative COVID test, but a lot of the symptoms look like it other than sore throat. But he, he, it was a negative test when they tested him with COVID, but he's not feeling real well. Maybe more, maybe the flu or something, but any of that is, is tough, whatever it is. We want to pray for a lot of our folks, you know, us and others and stuff too, with the nasty weather that's doing here Saturday yeah. and Sunday morning. Yeah, so five or six inches of snow possible and stuff in here. So. Yeah, so and I know we have some traveling. Um, Roberto will be traveling back from work, and I'm sure we'll have a few others. So yeah, I'll definitely pray for that for the weather, and people moving about. Anyone else? Any other announcements that I've overlooked? We need to remember. Okay. Um, Dwayne, would you mind opening us in prayer? Let us pray. Our beloved Father in heaven, we thank you so much for all the joys and blessings that you give us each day. At this time, Father, we thank you for this time that we have to be together to study your word, to help us to be able to see how the New Testament works, how the people lived, and how the people of God lived. Father, we ask you to be with those that were mentioned that are sick, 
that are in need of your care. Please be with us now as we go through the rest of this lesson. Please forgive us of our sins. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, don't forget, tomorrow, 1030, we'll um, continue our study of the book of Revelation. If you can be here, we'd love to have you. It's been a good study. I've really enjoyed that. And then again, of course, Sunday morning at 930 for Bible class and 1030 for worship. All right. So uh, in our study in this class, we have been looking at the kings. We have moved from King Saul now uh, to David being anointed king. Um, is that window active? Is that my clicker? There we go. Thank you. Uh, so in our last study, uh, we noted how uh, you during this transition period between Saul, uh, following Saul's death, David becoming king, being anointed, uh, there's this war that breaks out between Judah and Israel. And uh, there's some conflict uh, as a result of that. Um, uh, during that, um, uh, Abner has a break with Ish in, uh, in the north. Um, uh, and he comes to, to David to make a covenant with him. We looked at that. Uh, and then following that um, covenant, Joab finds out about it. Job's upset Abner. He killed Abner in vengeance, uh, murdered him. And then as we closed class last week, we, we noted how David mourned the death of Abner. Uh, at one time, a sworn enemy. Uh, but now he mourns him and, and mourns that loss. Uh, of course, doesn't take it like Joab believes he will. Uh, in this study tonight, we'll continue on with that. Uh, um, Saul's son Ish-bosheth is murdered. Uh, we'll also see David's reaction to that as well. Uh, and following his death, it allows opportunity for David to be anointed king over all of Judah. Now, again, real quickly, how many years is David king in... How long is this period of time before he's anointed king over all Israel? Anybody remember? Seven years. Seven years. So for seven years... You've had these, this war play out between the two groups, the factions, and, and now he's finally going to be anointed king. Uh, David begins uh, his reign over Israel. We'll, we'll note that. Um, and one of the first things he does is he goes to battle against the Philistines, and he also decides to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Judah. And that's going to be a pretty significant thing. There's some things that happen along the way uh, that we'll talk about as well. And then finally, uh, we'll just note real quickly, uh, Michael, um, her relationship with Daniel, I mean, sorry, with David, and uh, it's not as glowing as maybe it was first uh, thought to be. So we'll jump into that. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4. In verse 1, uh, the text reads, When Ish-bosheth, uh, Saul's son, heard that Abner had died at Hebron, his courage failed, and all Israel was dismayed. So um, he's heard about the death, you know, his reaction. Um, you know, he's already, he'd already done Abner wrong to start with, but now he knows he holds no hope of that. Uh, he's... Um, He's there in Mahanan, um, you know, uh, with no real plan of what to do next. Uh, you go on into verse 2. It says, Now Saul's, sons had, uh, Saul's son had two men who were captains of raiding bands. So these are his captains. Uh, the name of one was uh, Bana, and the name of the other was uh, Rechab. Uh, sons of Remon, a Benjamin, a Benjamin from Beeroth, um, and then he goes in talking about Beeroth. But, uh, so you've got these two captains. They know what's going on. They can read the, uh, the, the layout, right? They, they, they can understand who's winning this. It's not their guy. Ish is, uh, his, his power is gone. His, his reign is weaning. Uh, and so what do they do? Well, going down to verse 5, 
Somebody read 5 through 8, please. Who wants to grab that? Then the sons of Remen, the Parasite, Rechab, and Bana set out and came at about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who was lying on his bed at noon. How far? Go down to verse 8, if you don't mind. And they came there all the way into the house as though to get weed. And they stabbed him in the stomach. Then Rechab and Benah, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. Then they struck him and killed him, beheaded him, and took his head, and were all night escaping through the plain. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David at Hebron. And said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. And the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king this day of Saul and his descendants. So you've got these two captains. Um, I don't, it doesn't really explain what the real motivation is, but they're motivated in some way. They, they I guess, assume that. You know what? We'll kill Ish. We'll we'll then take his head to David, and we'll be rewarded by David uh, for doing this. They really do it in a really cowardly way, right? They wait until he's asleep. Uh, there he is, and they kill him, uh, stab him in the stomach, um, and then cut off his head. Very brutal, right? Very brutal, and uh, very cowardly, and and so. They, I guess they just believe, hey, just like the young man who, who killed Saul, um, you know, believed that he was going to get rewarded, right? Uh, that's the way they think. Well, how does David respond? You're going down in the text here. Verse 11 and 12. Somebody read 11 and 12. This is part of David's response to them. So, what, how does David respond to them? All right, not, not the response they expected. All right, he, he's upset. He's angry. Um, yeah, he even, verse 11, he's basically calling them cowards, right? Who goes in while a man's sleeping and kills him? I'm paraphrasing. But, um, and he calls them uh, wicked men. And it's interesting, how does he describe Ish? A righteous man. That's interesting, isn't it? He could have known him pretty well, living in Saul's house. Yeah. And whether or not he's righteous, I don't know. But that's how David at least chose to view him as he's a better man than you two. You two are wicked. And um, he has them killed. Uh, he cuts off their hands and their feet. What is that about? Huh? Bug it out. So you uh you have them hanged, and then what does he do to Ish? Again, an enemy. It is interesting, before Ish is made king, you never hear really about Ish. You hear about Jonathan, you heard a lot about Saul, you heard a lot about David. Ish doesn't really come in the picture. So we don't really know, I don't think, the relationship of David and him. Uh, but we do know that Ish tried to set himself up as king, uh, he tried to fight David. But how does David treat him? Well, he has his head buried. Respect. Yeah, a real sign of respect by burying his head in the tomb, right? Um, 
and in the tomb of Abner. And we've seen just last week how he treated Abner and how respectful he was, how that he respected even his enemies, right? And, um, you know, it uh, makes me wonder how respectful are we toward our enemies? How, how do we treat those who, who maybe don't like us, who maybe at times uh, do bad things to us or even just aggravate us, right? How do we treat those people? You know, how does David treat them? Um, and, and so you have a very different reaction here. Again, David proving himself to be a man after God's own heart over and over again. That's why I want to keep bringing these examples up because this is, really goes to the character of David again and again. Questions about that? My question, but David mm-hmm. also, I, just as much because Saul was the God's anointed, but he wouldn't harm Saul when he was sleeping either. Right? Oh, was, good point. He was right in there, so that had to also flash through his mind. I mean, it just gives you a sense of his view of that. You don't go in when someone's helpless like that and just at least... In that yeah, great comparison. I, you know, that's, that's a good thought. You know, you do see a stark contrast between those two men and David's character, and just those two events. All right, so um, let's go on. Uh, so now you've got a vacuum, right? Uh, you've got David. He's been anointed king in the south, but really the the north is still kind of is a kind of a mess. Um, uh, you know, Abner had established uh, Ishbosheth as the king in, uh, in, in Mahana, uh, but how established was he? He didn't seem very established, right? And, and so you've got this pretty big area now. Uh, what happens? Well, uh, David, of course, God is providentially working to bring him into the gap to fill that gap of, of leadership. If you go down, uh, go to chapter 5, verse 1, beginning at verse 3, the text tells us, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are, bone and, uh, we are your bone and flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led us out and brought, uh, brought in Israel. Uh, And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people, Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. It's interesting. They they know that, right? They know what God has proclaimed about David. Um, And then in verse 3, it says, So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. When it talks about David being uh, making a covenant with him, why? Wh- what is that? What's what's going on there? Why make a covenant? Why not just simply anoint him king? What's the covenant about? Okay, so it's about building trust between the two sides. Um, Though they knew what God had said about David, they weren't all clamoring for him to be king, were they, prior to this? And now they are. Any other thoughts about what what that has to do with anything? What's a covenant about? Yeah, and so we think about covenant, that, that term is used a lot in Scripture, in the Old Testament specifically. A lot of discussion about covenants. We think about the covenant that God made with Abraham. We think about the covenant that God made with Saul. Um, what about the covenant that Samuel made with David, right? A covenant that God made with David. 
uh, and there's more covenants than that. But you think about the idea of covenant, and we we just got finished talking about this a little bit uh, in our Sunday morning class downstairs. Was when you think of covenant, you think relationship, right? Uh, one of the most cr- closely related things we see today is a marriage, right? Think about marriage. Marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant between three parties. What three parties? Yeah, and those three all come together in a single covenant. Now you've got a very similar thing where you have David, the people, and God coming together in a covenant relationship. Uh, Covenants are always based upon what? Trust. Agreement, right? You think about when you, uh, if you're married or, or been married in the past, what are marriages built on? Well, isn't it those things, right? It's built on trust, right? It's my ability to trust someone else. Right? I'm giving you something that's very dear to me, which, you know, and, and so I'm going to trust you to hold that. I'm, I'm trusting you to hold my heart, and, and I, I want you to protect it. And so my ability to love you, my ability to be attached to you, is dependent on my ability to trust you with my heart. Because if you hurt my heart, there's nothing more deeply scarring than that. And so you think marriage is, number one, built on trust. Number two, it's built on agreement. We're making an agreement together. What agreement are we making? Well, there's a few what are the agreements we make together? Yes, sir. Do you have something, Dwayne? Oh, um, sorry. But no, I you're... did have a point. The, the agreement is between three parties. Mm-hmm. David is promising, number one, he's promising God that he's going to do his best. He's promising the people that he's also going to do his best. Mm-hmm. And what the people is in the leaders of Israel are looking for to make sure that David is going to be a good king, that he's not going to be mean to them because they were kind of against him for seven years. Mm -hmm. And God is over all of this because he is promising to bless Israel under David if everybody goes by the agreement and does what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Well, and, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. So you've got these different parties. So go back again real quickly to the marriage thing. Right? You're agreeing to, um, to treat one another kindly. You're agreeing to, to work together, um, to overcome difficulties together, right? And, and there's a lot in that, I know. But there's that agreement. Well, there's also agreement between you and God, right? Between each party and God. Well, same thing here. Uh, Like Dwayne mentioned, David's making certain agreements, right? Certain promises. He's promising to the people. He's promising to God. God's making certain promises. And the people have to make promises, right? They're making promises to God and to David. And so you've got this union here. So it's not just simply the act of anointing him king. There's more to it, right, with God's people. Now, we don't ask that of the president. We, other rulers and, and other nations don't do that. But Israel has a special relationship with God that other nations just simply don't have. And, and so uh, they're inviting, inviting God into this union. And, and so you, you've got this, uh, this coming together of all three groups making promises. Now, God... Never fails on his end. So that, that's secure. But the other two groups struggle at times. And that's always what causes problems in these covenants. Uh, and, and so, but, but now he's been anointed over, uh, king over all Israel. He's going to be king for how long? 33 more, more years. 40 total years. I think he's 70, about that age when he dies. Um, when you look at um, his reign here, you know, of course, he covers a pretty vast area. Um, 
and looking at David. So it's here. Whoops. Uh, hit the wrong button. I really, I really went. All right, so we're in Hebron here. This is where he's anointed king. Uh, but he's going to be king over this whole area, way up here, right? That's all going to be his and, and, and the people's. And so you've got him here. He's in Hebron. Uh, he's been made king. Uh, I've already, we already noted this, but in verse 4, it, the text tells us that, that he was 30 years old when he began to reign. Um, and, he began, and he reigned for 40 years um, at Hebron. Um, when we talk about Hebron, going back here for just a second, um, just noting where it is here on the map, uh, what is Hebron? What's it later noted as? City of Refuge. That's the Judea area, right? It's Jerusalem, right? And, and so um, we'll note more about this as we go. Um, of course, here's Bethlehem. We know that. That's, that's where, I believe, wasn't it David was born there as well? Uh, but of course, that's where Christ is going to be born later on. We'll, we'll, we'll say more about that later. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So Bethlehem is right here. And we're down here. This is Hebron. All right, so let's, uh, let's progress forward here. Um, so... Um, and then, uh, so the text at Hebron, he reigned over Judah for seven years and six months. And at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Um, nevertheless, verse 7, uh, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Um, of course, noted because, you know, it's his. Um, that, that's where he reigned. Uh, verse 9, am I getting the, I don't want to get behind. Uh, verse 9, and David lived in the stronghold and called uh, it the city of David. And David built the city all around him from uh, Milo and inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. So, um, so let's go back. I didn't put the map in here again, so I got to go backwards. So you got him anointed here. I don't think it has. All right, so here's where he's anointed. So I don't want to speak wrong. He ended up coming up here to make his stronghold. And this is where he began to build the city and up um, the city of Jerusalem, the city of David here. So right near Jericho and Gibeon. And so he begins to build the city around him um, years into the future. Eventually it's where the temple will be built. Questions about that? So just a little geography. Kind of get us to where we know we are. So I mean think about Jerusalem. We often think about Jerusalem. Well that doesn't really occur until David's reign. Um, you also don't uh, typically think about the Ark of the Covenant. I mean you usually think about the Ark of the Covenant but uh, we're going to see it's maybe not where you think it, it should be, and it's not. David's going to try to take care of that as we move forward. Do you have a question? Um, uh, so let's go on to verse 11. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note uh, uh, some of the other people around him's reaction. You have Hiram, the king of Tyre. Um, verse 11 says he sent messengers to David and cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. Who built the house of David? I think it's fascinating. Hiram, king of Tyre, built him. Now Tyre is kind of significant. Do y'all know why? 
Any, any, y'all remember anything about Tyre? Huh? Was there something that happened with Tyre and Sidon? I'll say it one more time. Yeah, Tyre and Sidon. Uh, it got destroyed. I mean, twice it was destroyed. Is not where the old tire was. Yeah, so it was actually destroyed twice. It was prophesied to be destroyed twice. Um, and it happened. Um, and I, I should know this. Um, I can't remember who the first group was that came in. But the second time it was decided, de- destroyed, sorry. The second time it was destroyed, it, it was destroyed completely. And it was destroyed by Alexander the Great. Y'all have heard of Alexander the Great. Kind of a, a neat story of what happened there. If you go back um, in the Old Testament, it prophesies that when the city is destroyed, um, uh, that, well, let me say this first. So Tyre was right on the coast. So if I go back here, does our map have it on there? Yeah, I don't have it on this map here. Well, I won't try to point it out. I think it's further north up here, but I'm not for sure, but I think it's up here. Uh, But um, Tyre was an interesting city because you had, it was right on the coast, the main city was, but they had a little small island out to the, would that be west of the coast, but it was right off the coast. And so when they were attacked, they would flee the city and go out to the island and wait it out. So the first time it was destroyed, and uh, I should remember who it was. I'm sorry. Huh? Wasn't it with Paul? He said the island was Cyprus, right? No, no, that's a different island. Um, that's a much bigger island than the one you're talking about. Um, but they would flee, they did, they fled to that mountain, they came in, they they tore the place apart, but they couldn't couldn't get to them, so they packed up and went home. Well, what did Tyre do? They came back, rebuilt. Well, when, when Alexander the Great came against them again, they tried that, they went to the island. Well, Alexander the Great was a much more ambitious and stubborn man. And he was not going to, um, uh, to stop with just letting them off, right, and leaving. So after sieging them for a while, after destroying the city, he actually took the materials from the city, put them in the sea, and built a land bridge out to the island. Completely wiped it off the map, wiped the people off the map, And what's fascinating about it, and I should get, I'll get this prophet for you, but it was prophesied in the Old Testament that they would, um, long before it ever happened, I think it, well, I won't guess it who it was, but the prophet prophesied about the materials from the city being used to destroy it, that it would be wiped clean. And that's what happened. Fascinating stuff. I'll get that prophet for you. Uh, I should remember that. Uh, but fascinating. So here is Tyre, long before that. Hiram the king. Um, Hiram the king is the one that built David's house. He's the one that sent in the carpenters and the material and built this majestic house for David. Um, and um, we'll have more to say about David's house in just a minute or as we move forward here. He'll have some things to say. Uh, is Ezekiel the prophet? I believe so, yeah, it's Ezekiel. Thank you, uh, Doug. Ezekiel prophesies about what's going to happen to Tyre years and years before. And as he prophesied, it happens exactly that way. Fascinating stuff. And I was thinking about where Jesus talks about Tyre and Sidon, and he talks about how. Okay. You know, if you, if what if Tyre and Sidon would have done, if we would have done this? Oh, okay. Yeah, so he's comparing the Pharisees' lack of repentance to, to the way um, uh, Tyre and Sidon would have repented had they been given the chance. And it says it should be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for 
Yeah. And so, yes, ultimately that Alexander the Great destroying them was a judgment of God against the city of Tyre. Um, and that's what Ezekiel gets into. All right, so... Um, So you've, you've got David's house built. You go on down, 2 Samuel 5, 13. Uh, David was at times a man after God's own heart. Doesn't mean he didn't get things wrong. Uh, it says, verse 13, David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. And after he came from Hebron, more sons and daughters were born to David. Uh, and then it goes through the names. I think it's interesting to note among those names is at the end of verse 14, it says uh, Solomon. Of course, Solomon would eventually become king. Solomon is the son of who? Bathsheba, right? So she, was, uh, she bore Solomon, who would eventually become king after David. Um, but, you know, David was not a perfect man. Uh, I don't think the Bible's endorsing his concubines and, and all that he did along those lines. Uh, but just simply noting that. Um, so, we get into the reign of David. Any questions about any of that? I just thought that was interesting information that probably is good for us to know. Solomon will outdo David on the wives and concubines thing. Uh, um, kind of amazingly. Uh, but uh, David kind of begun, begins that that practice of, of marrying multiple women and having multiple concubines. All right, so David, after becoming king, one of his first actions we find out is to go against the Philistines. You go to verse 17 of chapter 5, 2 Samuel 5. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. So they're, they're coming to try to attack David. I think it's fascinating. David has just been, he spent how many years in Ziglag uh, with, uh, with the Philistines. And, and he had even offered to battle with them. Now he's king of Israel, their sworn enemy. And now they're coming to look for David. So verse 17, he goes into the stronghold. There he awaits um, God's answer, verse 19, David goes to God and asked him, verse 19, shall I go up against the Philistines? Again, very unlike uh, Saul, David's first uh, initial thought is to do what? Go to God. Now, I wish David had thought about that and marrying all those women. All right? But in this case, he does, right? He goes to God, he says, he asked basically God, should I, should I go up against them? Um, uh, will, uh, will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So God gives him the confirmation to go on. Uh, verse 22, if you go down just a little bit in the, con in the text there. And the Philistines came up again and spread out in the valley of, of Rephim. And when David inquired of the Lord... So, um, uh, what to do? Um, God says to him, he gives him a little different direction. So God doesn't always give David the green light to do whatever he wants. This time he says, you shall not go up. Uh, so first God said yes. And now this time he says, no, don't do that. He gives him actually some uh, battle planning uh, he says, you shall not go up, go around to their rear and come against them opposite of the balsam trees. And uh, of course, verse 25, David did as the Lord commanded him. And because he'd done what God told him to, what happened? He struck down the Philistines from Giba to Gezer. And so David gets his first real victory after becoming king over all Israel. Uh, establishing his kingship. Yes, ma'am. Was there some change in their leadership of the Philistines? Because I thought they were, um, I knew that the commanders at one point did not want David to go and fight them. Well, the king, oh man, what is his name? Um, 
We just studied this in the sub my mind. But the king, of course, liked David a lot. And, but the commander said, no, he can't go up. We don't want him. Uh, and he sent him back to Ziglag. Uh, but now I don't know, I don't know what's transpired in, in, uh, in Philistia at this point. We're, we're what, uh, around eight years past that? Seven to eight years? So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, maybe somebody else knows who the king would be. I, I'm not sure. Uh, so God does give him this victory. They, uh, they resoundingly defeat the Philistines. So David, uh, that's how his, how his kingship begins. Um, very important. Then David turns his attention to the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and he wants it brought to Jerusalem. Now, as I mentioned, Jerusalem is being built up at this point. David's established his, his home there, uh, built his house there. He's, the city's beginning to build up around him. Now, what do we not have at this time? No tabernacle. No, I'm mean, sorry, no temple. There's no temple. And um, I'm not even sure. Well, I won't say that because I'm not sure. Um, so we don't have the, the temple built. Now, when will it eventually be built? Solomon will be the king that actually builds it. David won't ever get to do that. Now, David won't, will want to, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But, um, but um, it, it's not even been built yet. So I really want to dig into this section. And so I, I don't want to steal anything away from that. So we'll, we'll, we'll hammer that. Next time we'll, we'll look at the Ark of the Covenant and then move forward uh, in David's reign uh, here in 2 Samuel. Uh, any questions about anything thus far or comments? Achish. Well, he was so he was the king that loved David, uh, and so I'm. I, he very well could still be king at this point. So thank you for reminding me of the name. I would think so. Yeah. Of course, they bucked at the king's <laughs> command to let David go with them the first time. Wasn't the thing the comment on David and the concubines and wives, wasn't that pretty common among the people of those days, among the many nations? So he, sort of just, he was sort of just acting like the people around him. Yeah, which is the big problem, right? But I would think that's a much more of a deal with kings than the common people. Now, they may have multiple wives, even among common people. But I would think that it's almost a, a luxury of being king. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was a very worldly-like thing to do. Yeah, and there were uh, many leaders who would do stuff like that. All right. Uh, well, before we close, just on that comment, you know, Matthew uh, 19 Remember what Jesus said right? he, in, in this discussion of marriage uh, in reference to allowing multiple marriages. He notes that, that they were allowed to do that because of the hardness of their heart. But that was not what God's intended purpose was. And what Jesus, I believe, is inferring there is that we as human beings or the people that lived during that time, they're the ones that went astray from God's command. Right? And so David is going along that flow with all those others. Which means even a good man or good woman can get caught up in the flow of the world and get sucked into it uh, because it's something you want. All right. Thank you all. We'll, uh, we'll pick up um, chapter 6 next week. Thank you.